at that beautiful cookie, Doc. See how guys, see how nice that came out in that previous video? That's what it looks like. Mmm. So good. So good. Welcome, Jordan. We're gonna talk today about a video testimonial I received from a client. What did that video testimonial entail? How a COVID patient recovered from their death sentence. How do you think they did it? Uh, well, I, I think I know how they did it. <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> it's, uh, with um, intravenous vitamin C. Mm -mm. Uh, wasn't intravenous vitamin C? Why are you saying that though, Jordan? Well, <laughs> one of the things that the doctor recommended was vitamin C. Mm. But we'll talk about intravenous vitamin C in a minute. What, do you, what vitamins do you think the doctor recommended in order for this person to get better? And I swear on both of my children, Jordan and I did not have this conversation before. Just asking them. Give me, give me uh, two vitamins that you think that he recommended for his immune system. Vitamin D. Vitamin D. What other one? Uh, A. Vitamin A. <laughs> I know because I because we were talking about those the other day. Vitamin D and vitamin A for the treatment. God, and this guy, this, this doctor must have been a genius. No, vitamin not. D, vitamin A, and vitamin C, guys. Let's go deeper into it, but you know that if you've been watching this channel, you know why we're having trouble digesting vitamins A, vitamin A, vitamin D, where to get vitamin D, why we're deficient in it. And we, we've talked about some of the complications there, but let's talk a little bit more about vitamin C. If you've been paying attention, we said that just oral amounts of vitamin C isn't really enough to effectively act as an antiviral. We're not telling you not to take it. We told you to take a look at Linus Pauling's work, which I hope you've done, but, but high dose vitamin C is something that both Jordan and I do quite often. But let's talk about the studies with intravenous vitamin C. I'm gonna put a link right up here. By the way, I'm gonna put a link to the video that I'm talking about that the, my client sent me about this story right here. So you can click right there. See, so just look above, see the link? You can click that and you can listen to them yourself talking about vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin C. If you if you don't see the link, you should go on a laptop, like a desktop computer, because sometimes it doesn't show up on mobile. So just, okay. yeah. I'm also gonna put another link to this vitamin C treatment right there. It's, it's a doctor talking about treating 50, five, zero different, really, really critical condition people in COVID-19. Now, of the 20% of the people, 19% of the people that wind up in a hospital, we know that that we have a death rate that's fairly high. Out of the 50 people, zero died. Zero on this vitamin C intravenous, intravenous vitamin C treatment, which we've talked about in the past. Guys, we're going to talk a little bit more about vitamin C today, but check this out. Remember we talked about tonsils yesterday and we talked about tonsils, spleen, gallbladder, appendix. So check this out. Jordan, why don't you tell everybody, what did we find out about kids who had their tonsils removed? What was it before, 15 years old or something? something like that. I, I don't remember the exact age dem demographic bracket. but we, We've picked this out for you guys. Yeah, so the, the study found that this was the overall conclusion that removal of the tonsils resulted in a threefold greater chance of developing any type of upper respiratory infection in these in these demographics. So that's a threefold increase just by removing the tonsils, which is crazy. We'll put that link right up here. I yep. think we can put a link to that, right? Yep. You see that? See my finger? Click it for yourself. Guys, we're doing real time stuff here. We're asking the better questions. So that way, when the research comes out later, you guys already know, damn. Now you may say, but Tom, what if I had already had my tonsils removed? Here's what I'm telling you guys. What has this, what have all these seminars been about? It's been about how to have really, really great organ health, organ health. So guys, don't you think we should be thinking about what we feed our kids, what we do with our kids? Because we don't want our kids to have gallbladders removed. We don't want kids to have spleens removed we don't we want now sometimes it's unavoidable for different reasons what i am saying is that it often has to do with lifestyle and at the end of the day i think there's more than half a million tonsils removed in this country a year it's like it's like a birthright practically guys it's a problem and we should look into what can we do in order for us to have healthier 
tonsils, organs in general. I don't want to make this a whole um, seminar about tonsils, but I promise you there's things we can do, and maybe we'll talk about that another time. There's a, yeah, just a little bit of an extra addition about adenoids as well. Uh, the same study also found that adenoid removal, which often happens with tonsil removal, you don't, I don't, I don't know if it's how often they are separated or not, but uh, adenoid removal also separately increases the risk of COPD and upper respiratory infections by uh, two times. So if you have them both removed, that's really not good for you, especially with something like COVID-19. Now, my good friend David Green sent me a text last night, and I will put that link up here. Man, you guys are making me work today. Here it is. There's that link that David sent me. Thank you, David. And he, he sent me this link that said, what, what are the three things we, we now know that people are, like, what are the three symptoms that people have to know that, wow, they're much more likely to die? Now, so, I'm going to tell you what they are, and then we'll talk about them. One of them is ALT. What do you think that, what, what organ do you think that has to do with? Uh, your, well, your liver. It's your liver. <laughs> How many times have we been talking about fatty liver disease? Guys, why is ALT high? We'll talk about it again in a second. Hemoglobin, I remember a couple seminars ago, you heard me when I was talking in the office, when I was talking about the breath work, somebody had asked me previously about, um, about carbon dioxide and its magic that it does in the red blood cells. And I said it has specifically to do with hemoglobin. We're gonna talk a little bit about hemoglobin, but since we're talking about hemoglobin and since David sent me this, it got me thinking a little bit more about hemoglobin. It got me thinking a little bit more about what I see all the time when I deal with people in the office for nutritional counseling. You know what I see a lot of, how common it is? Iron deficiency, baby. Iron and hemoglobin. And one of the things, and maybe we could just start, eh, let's not start there. Let's just go back to fatty liver, but it's all related. So I want you to recognize what they're seeing, the three things is one is body aches. Sorry, I didn't say that. So body aches is pretty, uh, you know, ubiquitous to, to most flus and, and illnesses. But the other two are high L ALT and high hemoglobin. Low hemoglobin. I'm sorry, excuse me, low hemoglobin. Sorry, I apologize, low hemoglobin. So why would ALT be high? Well, it has everything to do with diet almost always. So we, we hear about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease used to be the main reason why ALT was high. Guys, for the past 20 years, that's become less and less and less and less the common form of fatty liver. It's because of all the things we're, all the things we're talking, see that, look, look at your phone. All the things we're talking about for the past 16 weeks about fatty liver disease, all this stuff is what's making your liver fatty. High sugar, way too much food, being um, 30, 40 pounds overweight. Guys, that's what we call organ fat. That is visceral fat. That is heart attack fat. That is how we know that you're going to have elevated ALT. Real simple. So this is sort of a red herring with, with what we've been talking about. So when we talk about these comorbidities, metabolic syndrome and being overweight, of course ALT is high. That's a red herring. What I'm really interested in is hemoglobin and what they're not talking about is iron. And this is not, so this we know is low. So why don't we just talk about hemoglobin a little bit? What can we say about hemoglobin, red blood cells? Why do they matter? Sure. Uh, hemoglobin is a protein in your bloodstream that basically transports oxygen around. It takes oxygen from high oxygen environments. So like from your lungs and distributed to lower oxygen environments. Um, Essentially, its basic, its job is to shuttle around oxygen. Um, it can be affected by a lot of different things. Uh, the binding of hemoglobin to oxygen increases its affinity for oxygen. So the more oxygen you have in your bloodstream, the more oxygen hemoglobin is going to bind. That's called a positive modulator. Then you have things like carbon dioxide, which is a negative modulator of hemoglobin, where it binds, it decreases the affinity of oxygen to hemoglobin. Uh, low blood acidity, so, or sorry, high blood acidity, so a low, lower blood pH also decreases the affinity. Which would be like when you're exercising, so you're, you, like that buildup will require now the oxygen to be released. Yeah, so it, it decreases the affinity of oxygen to the hemoglobin. And finally, um, uh, I said carbon dioxide, I said 
acidity and temperature. So high temperatures decrease affinity for oxygen to hemoglobin, low temperatures increase affinity for uh, oxygen to hemoglobin. Excellent. So how do we have, now how much hemoglobin do we have? Well, we have about 270 million hemoglobin in a red blood cell. 270 million. And how many red blood cells do we have? I don't know, like maybe a lot. <laughs> Guys, we're talking about orders of, there's a lot of hemoglobin in your body, but mm -hmm. what, here's the deal. When it comes to hemoglobin, how do we get more of it? Because if hemoglobin's low, how do we make sure it's high? Well, we already said one thing, making sure that you exercise. So in general, we're really asking, how do we have um, abundant, healthy red blood cells? Well, I'll tell you one thing. You know, wanna know how you can have problems with your red blood cells? Make sure you remove your spleen. Make sure you remove your spleen and then make sure that the liver has to do the work of the spleen. That's one thing that we know for sure. So when we talk about organ removal, if hemoglobin has something to do with this disease and we know that the spleen has something to do with, with getting rid of problematic red blood cells and we're asking the liver to do even more work and we already said the, if the more, everything goes through the liver, guys. So if we keep asking more and more and more of the liver, it's like the helicopter mom, has got to do everything. Eventually, something's gonna get dropped. You get the idea? So when it comes to hemoglobin, what can we do? Exercise, right? Especially cardiovascular exercise. So you're basically creating, remember guys, I had the machine in the gym, that hypoxico trainer. It's making a low altitude environment. It's taking oxygen out of the, air for you. Wait a minute. Wait a second. What, what are we doing every morning when we're doing our breath work? Breath holds? Breath holds. Breath holds. Hmm. What do you think we're doing during that breath work? We're teaching you to breathe properly, which we already talked about how important nitric oxide is. And we can go into the importance of nitric oxide here in this whole process a little bit. But guys, part of the training in the morning is not just learning to breathe properly throughout the day, it's also teaching you what these breath holds are doing and, um, and making sure that you breathe lighter and more steadily throughout the day. Making sure that oxygen gets where it, gets where it belongs so that your blood saturation, blood oxygen saturation stays higher throughout the day. What do we know that's happening here? We know that the blood oxygen saturation is lowering and lowering and lowering the more sick that they get. Similarly, you want you know better hemoglobin, make sure that your diet's right. How do you know? You do the things we're talking about here. Go look back up here. See, we're talking about where to get your carbs, where to get your proteins, and where to get your fats. I promise you, you follow those rules of thumb, you're gonna have nice, strong, healthy red blood cells. Anything else on that, buddy? Uh, I, think, I think that's good. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit about um... Well, I, I, could, I guess you did kind of just go into it about how, you know, the oxygen saturation is lowering. That's probably contributing to the deaths of these people, because, I mean, if your lungs are filling up with, with fluid from the, from the virus, obviously you're not going to be getting enough oxygen and you're also going to have higher levels of carbon dioxide. There's going to be a whole bunch of so, issues. So let's yeah. talk about that. Like when it comes to how these patients are being treated, so you, what is your body doing? What's being, what are the treatments? So one of the things your body is doing is it's going to increase heart rate, right? In order to make a, an effort to, to increase that blood, to increase the blood oxygen saturation. It's also going to raise all your vital signs, right? It's going to increase temperature. It's going to do all these things. The body's smart, right? What did Jordan just tell you about temperature? What, did, what do we know that's influencing hemoglobin? Your body's going to try to do it. But if there's one thing, Okay, so, and then you're going to go to the, uh, to the hospital and they're going to put you on a respirator and they're going to try to do things to make sure that, that you stay alive, right? Because we know that this is affecting your respiratory system. But the one thing that we know that increases blood oxygen saturation the most by far is hemoglobin and it's not even close, okay? I, I could write out the mathematical um, equation for you on another video, I'll do that. But when you look at the algebra, when you include hemoglobin, it's exponentially more powerful. So it's really important to have um, um, healthy red blood cells and a lot of hemoglobin. So watch what you eat, make sure that you're exercising. But there's one more thing here that we gotta talk about when it comes to iron. Iron is super important, Jordan told you. That's 
that is essentially at the heart of the hemoglobin, right? Really, yeah. So you basically have four hemes coming off and you can have one, one oxygen bound to each of these hemes, right? But it's literally the iron that's basically keeping this together, all right? It's, it's, there's a, a dance that's happening here. Now, what, what, what is the problem with low iron? Now, this goes into to our speculation now. I am predicting, and I think Jordan will agree with me, that I think you're gonna start people, seeing people who have anemia, that is particularly specific to iron, okay, to, to low iron in the blood, they may be more prone to what we're seeing here. But here's the thing, I mean, that just makes sense, right? You don't, I don't have to even go into much more science here other than to show you this, but what is causing it? What's causing the low iron? One of the things that's causing it is your digestion. What is the first thing we talked about? Stomach acid. Where is this iron being broken down? It's being broken down in the duodenum and the first part of the jejunum. It's your small intestine, guys. We know for a fact that that's where a lot of the problems happen. So you need strong, healthy stomach acid in order for the iron to, be, to start to be properly broken down by your body. And then when it gets into that small intestine, that's where you, you really have issues if you have gut problems. And we already talked about all the problems going on in the jejunum, excuse me, in the duodenum and certainly into the jejunum. So the bottom line is that's where you have pancreatic enzymes. That's where you have gallbladder. That's where we talked about all the problems with the organs, with low stomach acid. We've created a perfect environment in most people to make sure that iron is low. Well, if hemoglobin has something to do with this disease and iron has something to do with hemoglobin, hmm, what do you think? Do you think maybe we're gonna start seeing people who are anemic with more symptoms here? What do you think? Oh, yeah. You think that makes sense? I think that makes sense. Why don't we talk about, so you may say, but Tom, how do, I, how do I fix it? Well, other than fixing your digestion, tell people what, what's the one vitamin that we know that helps um, increase the absorption of iron? Uh, vitamin C. Vitamin, vitamin C. Vitamin C puts iron in, it's called an oxidation state that allows it to be more easily absorbed and ut utilized by the body. Um, in fact, it's such a strong effect that taking very high dose vitamin C for a long period of time can actually result in iron toxicity. It's actually been documented. So obviously that's not at normal doses, that's at super high doses. So let me, let me just be clear here. All right, thank you for saying that. Mm -hmm. The body doesn't want to give iron up. Mm -hmm. It doesn't give it up easily. What I am saying is, is that I believe, and you can look this up for yourself, that something like 30% of the population has problems with iron absorption. Yeah, the same people that have problems with B12 absorption are gonna have problems with iron absorption. Yeah, so do you think B12 has something to do with iron absorption? Oh yeah, I mean, B, well, B12 and uh, deficiency of B12 is called pernicious anemia for a reason because it's required for the, for the development of blood cells, so. So absolutely. vitamin C, vitamin B12, guys, and fix your digestion. But let's talk about, so we know, if we want to make sure that our iron is being used. So if you're one of those, I believe it's 30%, I'll double check that for you, who have low iron levels. Vitamin B12, vitamin C helps the absorption, helps the, um, the body's use of, of iron in general. But what about things that block iron? Yeah. So is there some, are, are there things that we should avoid when we're eating foods that are high on iron or if we take an iron supplement? Because yeah. if you don't take iron supplements, unless you were told by a doctor to take an iron supplement, but what would block iron absorption? Yeah. So, I mean, one of the most common supplements for especially older women to take is calcium. And um, you, you see like the calcium pills with the D3 and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but if you're trying to get more iron in your diet, taking that iron pill with that calcium pill is going to, you're not gonna absorb any of that iron. It, it's gonna completely blunt that effect because the amount of iron that you need in a day is so much lower than the amount of calcium you need in a day. And they use the same transporters. So if you're taking a gram of calcium, just by chance, those, those transporters are gonna be saturated way before you absorb any of that iron. So calcium supplements are something you wanna avoid. So, so now this is a question, I'm asking Jordan a question now. So calcium binds to oxalates, does, do oxalates bind to calcium? Do we know? Uh, to to calcium, yeah. yeah, like yeah. What, excuse me, do oxalates bind to iron? So if we have mm -hmm. foods that are super high in oxalates, 
which would be, you know, lots and lots of leafy greens. Um, would that, do you know if that would cause a problem with iron absorption? I, I, I don't think so. We'll look it up okay. for you. All right, we'll look it up. Actually, Jordan will look it up right now. Yeah. The point is, guys, is we're having a real-time conversation. The, the, the issue is, is that if you're not asking these questions, then you're missing out on opportunities to to grow your knowledge base. So again, th all this stuff, COVID-19, it's happening real time. We're getting stuff real time. We're trying to be ahead of the curve for you guys and showing you guys these things and being ahead of the next question is what we're trying to do for you. So, okay, so I found this is a study from PubMed. This is from 2017 and it claims, so the, the results are after normalization for the spinach reference meal absorption. So they're, they're trying to see if oxalic acid from spinach is in influencing the iron status of individuals. Um, geometric mean iron absorption from wheat bread rolls with kale uh, did not differ significantly from wheat bread rolls plus uh, spinach, as and and also even with added potassium oxalate to the meal. So they mm -hmm. even added extra oxalate to the meal, and it still didn't affect the iron. Absorption. So the oxalates don't seem to inhibit the iron. Yeah. Absorption. So it's a, the conclusion is that oxalates did not influence iron absorption in humans. Uh, from either a kale meal or a meal from fruits. So the, so the main takeaway here, guys, is calcium is the main thing that's yeah. going to block. And iron also, if you're taking, like, at, during this time, we talked about this previously, if you're taking um, zinc, right. uh, uh, like a high dose of zinc, higher higher dose of zinc than you normally would, that's also going to compete for iron absorption. It won't necessarily block it. So if you're taking 15 milligrams of, of zinc and you're taking 45 milligrams of iron, you're still going to absorb some of that. Iron. But that's a good reason why you, you separate these supplements. You yeah. take your zinc at night, you get your iron throughout the day. Makes sense, guys? Mm -hmm. All right. Similarly, if you're taking a calcium supplement, and if you are, please talk to me first. Tell me why you're taking that calcium supplement, and I'll send you some stuff that maybe you shouldn't be, maybe why you shouldn't be. But if you are, for some reason, again, you don't want to be taking your calcium supplement with, with iron or high iron foods because if you really need that iron in your body, you got to start thinking about these things, guys. All right. Hey, you like this content? You think it was awesome? I thought it was awesome. Give it, give us a thumbs up. Give us a comment at the bottom. Most importantly, please share it and subscribe if you haven't already. Thank you, everybody.